Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. My apologies for uh, us beginning a little bit late. This is the first time that uh, the Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship actually hosts something during the day. We did this as an attempt to have further outreach with academics, so we'll see whether or not it's, uh, it's working in terms of time. Um, at any rate, uh, we at the Asfari Institute are really thrilled to be organizing and hosting this discussion on academic research and conflict. And we're particularly thrilled to be hosting it a week before our second annual conference on academia and social justice. At that conference, which you see these little blurbs right when you come in, at that conference next week, we will be discussing the challenges and opportunities for academics, be they faculty or students, to engage more productively, constructively, actively in issues of social justice, both within and outside the university walls. So numerous issues will be raised from marketplace economics to corporatization to political orthodoxy to pedagogy to students and faculty organizing, etc. Within that conversation that we were having when we were organizing that conference, another conversation arose, which is the issue of research ethics itself. What are the challenges for academic research in conflict or on conflict? What are the politics and ethics of knowledge production under war? What are the economics of knowledge production? What are the impacts of particular framings of academic research? And what is the ethical responsibility towards the communities themselves that are being studied and the communities themselves in question? So we went to three experts at our university. And what we're going to be having right now is a discussion with these experts about their own personal journey in understanding and exploring these questions. Our first speaker is Dr. Carmen Shaha who's a visiting assistant professor for public administration. She's an author of a very new book called Civil Society in Lebanon and Libya. She has been a visiting scholar researching citizenship in the Middle East and the Gulf at the Watson Institute at Brown University. And she joins academia with a decade-long experience in activism itself on electoral women and constitutional issues. Her intervention will address the dilemmas researchers face when studying and the particular conceptualizations of civil society amidst conflict and after decades of authoritarianism. She will focus mainly on her three years of field research in Libya, while also bringing up other country case studies, including in Iraq and in Tunisia. So we're going to be understanding through Carmen how we can produce knowledge that is both meaningfully sound and useful to the actors on the ground, and not simply useful to the academic journals that we as academics continue to be pushed to publish within. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Fuad Fuad, who is a Syrian physician. He is also currently an assistant research professor at the Faculty of Health Sciences, also here at the university. His research focuses on the health effects of displacement inside Syria and to neighboring countries, and the particular role of international organizations in strengthening health systems. He's the lead author in a recent ESQUA publication, which examines future policy options for health systems in rebuilding in post-conflict Syria. He will be discussing the historical and political background of key concepts, such as refugees, humanitarian system, emergency, and how those particular conceptualizations actually shape academic research itself. Our third and final speaker is Omar Dewishi who's also a physician and an assistant professor of anthropology and global health at FHS. While he was trained as a physician in Iraq during the 90s, he received his doctorate in social anthropology from Harvard in 2008. His research explores the social and medical consequences of war in the region with a particular focus on Iraq. His book that will be forthcoming in spring of next year is called Ungovernable Life, War and Mandatory Medicine in Iraq and it is based on archival and ethnographic research chronicling the politics of medicine and statecraft in Iraq from the British mandate through the US occupation. He's currently conducting ethnographic research on, quote, the ecologies of wounds and wounding in an increasingly militarized region. His project examines the experiences of patients, doctors, institutions with war afflictions, displacement, and the reconfigurations of healthcare institutions and healthcare geographies. His intervention in this panel will aim to reflect on the conditions, quote, of research as a vocation. What does that mean when your research is your vocation? And he will discuss the economy of knowledge production in a region struck by protracted political conflicts and international interventions. 
we constantly talk about ourselves as post-conflict, but are we really post-conflict or living in a protracted conflict? So we'll begin with Carmen and then go on to Fuad and then conclude with Omar and then open the space up for your questions and comments because we really wish this to be a very engaging discussion amongst us all. Great. Thank you so much, Rania and Esfari Institute for the opportunity. Um, and I hope that it's a start of a larger conversation. This is a region of many types of conflict and I think that we're faced with a different set of um, uh, challenges to deal with when doing this. Um, I'll start with a little bit my story. Fariha uh, Barqawi, Musalwa Bukaqis, Intisar al Hasiri, three women assassinated within months of each other in Libya and died of their gunshot wounds. Fariha was a, a dichotomy in herself, a secular communist, veiled, elected member to the General National Congress who referred, herself at, who referred to herself as civil society activist. Salwa was a human rights lawyer, a deputy chair of the National Dialogue Commission, um, to whom a lot of activists uh, refer to as being their mentor, so she's a civil society mentor. And Antisar was a young popular blogger uh, that was murdered in her home in Tripoli and that the media, Libyan media, reported civil society uh, activists murdered. How do we conceptualize the role that these women played and how can we, if at all, produce knowledge that may have avoided their deaths? In lieu of arguing for anything that's causal, neither in theory nor in the presumption of why these women were killed, I want to argue that researchers in the context of an ongoing conflict or in a context of a post-authoritarian regime are faced with unusual circumstances, uh, at least we can say these are unusual circumstances for research. While I know that my experience uh, need not be generalized, I want to share some highlights of my empirical work that was carried out over three years and then to open the floor for unpacking some of these dilemmas, both in how we conceptualize knowledge, but also on which type of knowledge to produce. I want to speak about wearing three different hats while I was in Libya, learning three things about research, but also cautioning against three potential pitfalls that we have as researchers. I interviewed Fariha many, many times. Um, her daughter Hind attended workshops that I was helping conduct with the Forum for Democratic Libya, uh, her daughter is early 20s. She's now a spokesperson for special measures in Libya's constitution on women. I worked with Hind and her mother on several other projects. During my research, I had three hats. Uh, first, I had normative assumptions, obviously, about what these women should do, what civil society should do in Libya. Of course, I supported a women's quota. Of course, I supported, supported free elections. Of course, I supported a law that could govern and protect um, associational life in Libya. So in that sense, I was an activist too. Second, I developed a connection uh, uh, with these women and with these people on the ground. I came and went oh, for more than three years. They knew me. Uh, we laughed together, we hoped together, and we both got sad as Libya's situation uh, worsened. So in that sense, I was Libyan too. But my third hat, I had signed a very rigorous process of a non-biased ethical approval uh, at my university that I would not jeopardize human subjects, that I would report without bias, with accuracy, that I would transcribe this data. So my third hat was I was an analyst, and as far as they were concerned, their experience helped me become recognized in academia. I was using them. Over three years, they called me doctora, although I was a strange blonde researcher that just arrived to Libya that knew very little about the context, uh, and I was a student, but they said, Doctora. Um, they taught me about Islam and democracy, women and conflict, and about the meaning of civil society as a space, particularly in a post-conflict, post-authoritarian system. I learned three lessons conducting research. We know, and it has been proven, and a lot of literature is emerging, that civil society is not a set of organizations. Uh, but this is something that the literature is still grappling to uh, unpack, okay? Um, civil society in Libya was a space for these people to meet, to share their priorities. It was not, if I had entered and said, I want to study this, I probably would have missed including these women entirely in my interviews and entirely in the category of civil society. Second, yes, it's true, civic activists don't need a regulatory framework to emerge. They emerged very spontaneously in Libya, first responding to humanitarian relief and then working on more governance and development issues. But by year three, Libya still had no constitution, had no framework for protecting civil associations, and it made it easy to target these women and others simply for speaking out. The initial beauty and charm of the chaos uh, was lost when Libyans became targeted 
uh, for speaking out and the country became much more polarized. Lesson three, civil society might need researchers to care, and I know that this is a sensitive issue. Academics don't like to say that they're engaged. It's all right to have a normative stance on these issues as long as it can be backed up by theory. And why don't we produce theory that um, is in line with our normative stances? Why borrow theory? Mm, for me, it was adopting a more functionalist approach. So I arrived and I needed to do something, some sort of research on civil society, but there were no munazamit, there were no organizations in civil society, but they were calling themselves civil society. And so I adopted a framework that argued that anybody working for pluralism, freedom of speech, accountability, rotation of power is contributing to a civil society per se. Three words of caution. Some theories will not apply in certain contexts. I've been speaking to first-time uh, women voters in Saudi Arabia. International standards uh, very much appreciate and strengthen um, and focus on the issue of secrecy of the vote. Uh, and for those women, secrecy jeopardizes their ability to make a meaningful uh, voting choice. And they say that consultation with elderly, with other women and with men is part of the process. And so in propagating and saying this is how a process should be, we might also miss speaking to those people that have a different opinion. Another word of caution, insider-outsider dynamics. I found it easier to do research in Libya and Iraq, or what uh, you know, other scholars will say, dangerous settings. Respondents wanted to speak, okay? Uh, they were not fatigued of the concept of civil society. Uh, they were not arrogant. 2,000 people filled the survey in Libya. 15 towns, not a single person said, like, what's this? We don't want to do it. We've done many assessments. People are very uh, eager to talk. And I know that we're speaking now in Lebanon. Sometimes it can take weeks and months to get to somebody to talk to you. And in Libya, I was able to speak to tribal leaders, elected members to the Congress, National Transitional Committee members, military leaders, Islamists, non-Islamists, women, youth. I spoke to tens and tens of people. The one outsider forte that you can bring um, is novelty, but also a display of a, key, of a very keen understanding of the culture. And I feel very privileged. These people said what they wanted to say. Uh, Libya is almost at war and nobody's able to enter. And so that time was very, very precious. Uh, a third word of caution. You may or you may not see the people that you are interviewing in a conflict setting, but there are ways to stay true to what you learned, uh, even if it's through policy and programmatic work. Academics should not shy away from the practical world, I believe. We have an obligation to speak to the communities and to the decision makers that affect the very same issues that we're seeking to understand and to try to improve. And to that end, I think Esfere does a beautiful way of bridging um, that gap. Uh, before academics shy, shy away from caring and from practice, we should also remember that it's advancements and setbacks in humanity that we're trying to understand and we owe it somehow to speak about um, that experience through the research that we do. I'm happy to elaborate on either angles. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rania. Thank you for uh, uh, coming. And thank you, uh, thanks for Asfari uh, Institute for inviting us. Uh, it's, it was so short uh, uh, intervention, so we'll <laughs> you save some time for us. But I want to use also part of my time for um, just to raise more questions than answers. And also happy, be happy to listen to you and to discuss that. So my intervention is about the politics, actually. This is the main title of the, uh, uh, our gathering now. It's the politics of academic research. And when talking about politics, um, I want to argue that there are a lot of politics when we are approaching any sort of academic uh, research uh, within crisis or um, post-conflict or post-crisis. Um, uh, so um, um, I will start talking about the some uh, terms that we used to, you know, use it in, in or use them when we are uh, writing or when we are proposing uh, on uh, 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 conflict um, in our academic approach. Those terminology that's the, that uh, 
I will just list down now is sort of just, uh, I, I pick them up just in ar arbitrary way. Mm -hmm. And just to raise this question, uh, first one, first term is the term needs. Mm -hmm. And we use that a lot. So uh, um, uh, need assessment, rapid need assessment, uh, responding to uh, people's need. But what we mean by need? Are we talking about urgent need? And we use also the word emergency. And this new word now is complex emergency. Are we talking about midterm need, long term need? So, how we can define uh, emergency in crisis. Are we talking about uh, time? So emergency, that means a short, short time or short term. Are we talking about nature of the crisis? Is it like a, a um, um, nature disaster or a conflict or war or, um, or talking about economic crisis? Are we talking about the context itself? So how we define you know, um, emergency? And if we, if we take some example from the region, um, we can see another term that uh, emerge. This is protracted now, or long term. And the, the main example is the Palestinian uh, crisis. You know, after uh, 67 years now, we're still using uh, now the term uh, uh, emergency, or uh, refugee, or displaced. And the same now after 10 years in Iraq, Libya, Syria, so it seems, Afghanistan, so it seems that this is the main characteristic now of the crises in the region is about protraction. It's, it's a long term. So can we still use the word emergency? And what's the implication of doing research, you know, in that, you know, context of term? The other term that uh, uh, is used a lot now is uh, refugee or refugees or refuge and this is you know we I want to put it like in, in, in sort of in confronting with other words that are used displaced or forced migration or vulnerable or asylum seekers and some time they use the word guest uh, and of course all that terms uh, refer to political implications you know guest now it's a uh, the word that used in Turkey for Syrian refugees. So those are not considered uh, refugees, those are guests. Uh, I'm trying to say that all these words, you know, uh, refugee uh, needs, humanitarian response system, are strongly rooted in politics um, uh, globally and in the region. Um, just to, to mention that you all know that this is very new term. Before the concept of, let's say, the country of nation, uh, nationality, which is very new concept also that started in 19th century, before that there's no this word that a refugee or displaced or, um, and this is very historical one. People moved for many reasons in the history. In, starting from the dawn of history, people moved for all that reasons of um, uh, political, uh, uh, war, uh, economic, seeking food or shelter, people move. But just recently, we have this concept about nationals and strangers. And later, the strangers uh, took this uh, fine word, which called refugee, after the um, uh, um, 1951, with this convention about you know, refugee, the International Convention on Refugees. Uh, then that was the first time it said this term, a definition of refugees. And what's the implication, what's the political implication of that? That we, the global uh, 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 community created another system or a new system to separate the uh, refugee group from the national groups or from those, uh, the nationals in one country. The other term also I want to uh, raise is the humanitarian response system, which is also a new one. As, as the definition um, of humanitarian aid is material and logistic assistance to people in need. It's usually short-term help until the long-term help by government. And 
other institutions replaces it. Among the people in need belong homeless, refugees, victims of natural disasters, war and famines. The primary purpose of humanitarian aid is to save lives, reduce suffering, and respect to human dignity. So it's clearly set it about, you know, short term, save life, and, um, and uh, reduce suffering. Typically, in response to humanitarian crises, including natural disasters and man-made disaster. It may therefore be distinguished from development aid. And if I want to now put the example of Syria crisis here uh, in, in the region, so from the early beginning, people know that this is a long-term crisis. But the system of a humanitarian response is a, by, by definition is a sort of short term. So when they uh, faced with the, the issue of development, they, I mean, as that uh, discussion with the uh, UNCR, they said, this is not our mandate. This is the mandate of another uh, agency, which is UNDP, which should wait till post-conflict, then uh, UNDP will function on that um, on, on that uh, domination. So this, all that words um, uh, come to mind when, when uh, discussing the issue of uh, politics and, 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 uh, and war. Uh, but so where's the academic institution, where, where the academic research when approaching that? In all these issues, we are obliged to use these terms. But we cannot use it without having, you know, uh, without looking into the political term. I will give some examples from the, uh, uh, the Syria crisis uh, and how that uh, actually put us in, uh, in, a, in, a, in facing this problem. One issue that we use a lot now in publications on Syria crisis is the issue of mortality. And I will argue here how politics this uh, uh, word is. Uh, the Office of UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, UNCR, which managed conflict death uh, numbers, stopped counting uh, serious dead in summer of 2014, citing lack of access to killing zones and an ever diminishing confidence in data sources. Whereas the General Secretary uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, has estimated Syria war dead at 250,000 deaths. I mean, that's in all publications that we as also, and as an uh, academician, use it. I mean, now you look all these publications that are around the Syria crisis and death, so the number of 200, uh, 250,000 deaths are there. Uh, whereas Ban, ban Ki-moon, advisors concede that the figure he cited is an edu uh, educated guest at, at best. It has frustrated efforts by the UN and array of independent human rights activists to present the world with the definitive tally of the country's war dead and in turn assign responsibility for the killing. Um, Uh, just recently, um, um, a report launched by a group inside Syria, uh, the Syrian Center for uh, 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 Policy Research, they put the number of 470,000 deaths during the war. And since, you know, uh, all this newspaper, you know, uh, came closely with this number and, you know, they rushed, you know, to put that on the, as, as a sort of headline, but as academy, academician, it's, it's difficult to use this number because there's no um, um, clear methodology and there's no uh, uh, clear sources. And, uh, um, and hence, we, we all know that the number is very high, but how to do that, we, 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 I mean, how to approach that, it's very difficult. These estimates matter, I mean, the mortality. They matter politically, and they matter in terms of setting the historical record straight. 
if you claim to care about protecting civilians from harm, you have to understand how civilians are being harmed. Specifically, what is the form of lethality that leads to death? The fact that UN is unable to publish a death count only underscores the depth to which the crisis has plunged. State Department spokesman, uh, um, that's the said by, by the spokesman of the State Department of the US. We, uh, academic researchers, still use the number 2,000 250,000 in our papers. Although we know it's very old estimates, we cannot say how many civilians and who is responsible because we don't have the number, because we don't know how to cal calculate this number, and this is about methodology and using our instrument, or because the sources are uh, very political. Who uses the number? Who, who collect data? But overall, because we always claim that we are neutral and to write anything in peer-reviewed journals, we should have a strict reference and source and a clear methodology. To, to close with that, uh, the issue of um, how to uh, academic researcher approach the issue of uh, uh, conflict and war, I want to set here uh, a few questions. Um, first, how to set agenda? or propose or conduct in conflict context? In response to need or in response to donor priority? And who set or decide the priority? And how to do survey or surveillance? And what type of research? Academic research or, ver or, or operational research or problem solving research? What about the issue of conflict of interest in doing research? What about the IRB or the ethical consideration when we should apply for a research? And the other question, the set of questions is about how to write peer review article. You know, you know that since the beginning of Syria crisis, just calculate some numbers, only six peer review articles now are in journals on the Syria crisis and, and, and I mean, talking about health issues. Research. Um, the majority actually are commentary, opinion, case studies, and um, um, no evaluation uh, on health response or, or intervention. And I will stop here and then open that to the uh, discussion later. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I I'm I'll start from a little bit of a different different point, different place, I guess. Uh, rather than comment on uh, what is the research and what is going on as something outside myself and outside uh, uh, kind of the practice and the career, I want to actually bring myself and bring actually the academic in in this conversation. And uh, to, to the main, basically the main argument that I want to kind of at least present or pro as a provocation in this, in this talk is to uh, say that the conditions of research is, uh, we cannot separate them from the, uh, the institution, from the material condition of the researcher and the institution that he or she works in. So in saying that, and I'll unpack this as, as I go along. Uh, in 1917, uh, a very famous, uh, actually the father of one of the fathers of sociology, uh, Max Weber, gave a talk to uh, graduate students uh, in Germany. Uh, and this is 1917. We're talking about three years uh, or two, uh, three years after 18, the, the 1917. Ah, 17. 17. Uh, three years after the beginning of the First World War. And the, the, the famous talk that became a very famous essay called Science as a Vocation. And in that essay, uh, Weber goes along to explain what are the material conditions of, 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 of science and what is the position of science in, in, uh, for, uh, uh, to understand value systems, to understand uh, life, uh, uh, position, positionality, and what can science offer us in general. Uh, what is interesting in that essay is that uh, Weber goes along to explain to us 
kind of he starts from the graduate student. Like he begins to talk to to talk about science as a career. He begins to to uh, invoke uh, uh, the differences between German academia, American academia, and looks at how the uh, the graduate student uh, uh, kind of slowly climbs into the uh, the career path of a pro of professorial uh, uh, positions. But also within that, uh, Weber uh, uh, gives us a lot of interesting uh, insights about what could science tell us. I mean, science as a uh, a different model of explaining value in, in the world. And he, of course, uh, 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 as, as people who know uh, Max Weber, uh, reaches a kind of a point where he says, you know, science doesn't really uh, allow us to explain uh, 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 what position to, to take. Uh, rather explains to us kind of means uh, and measures to justify a certain kind of position or another. So uh, uh, what is interesting about this essay is that, there, that this is happening all during the First World War, and there is no mention in that essay of the, uh, of the broader conditions in Europe, the, the conditions of war. But what you really see in that, in that essay, uh, and what Weber talks about, is the transitioning, uh, uh, the, the kind of the transformation that is happening in universities in general at that time. So uh, I don't want to go into the t this essay, but I, 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 when I was invited to this, uh, to, so that the kind of the first thing that came to my mind is to begin to think about the material uh, conditions of doing research. So, so rather than really thinking about the topics that we research, I want to think about how we are entangled in general in, in a broader uh, questions, uh, very personal ones sometimes, institutional ones. Uh, uh, I'm speaking, of course, from uh, the, the perspective of someone who does research on health, uh, global health, but also as an anthropologist. And I think these two kind of uh, 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 disciplines uh, can, can actually inform each other in many ways. Uh, the, the things that I, uh, I wanted to, to say, I mean, during the Civil War here in Lebanon, one of the things that happened here at this institution is this kind of uh, 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 diminishing role of AUB as a kind of, a, as, as part of a, an international beacon in the Middle East, and, uh, and that really affected uh, the way research has be, was, was being done in the region and the role of AUB as a kind of a center that could, could uh, uh, inform uh, broader questions, uh, international uh, kind of uh, uh, questions or broader research questions. What we see right now, what is really interesting is that we are uh, in a different mode uh, under this kind of current condition of war where within AUB we are actually striving into an international excellence, into uh, being a kind of having a very clear position. And you know, we, yesterday we came from a talk with, uh, with uh, President Fadlou Khouri, who was, was really kind of trying to, to, uh, to uh, talk about this dilemma. And, and there is very interesting uh, schizophrenic position for the researcher here. Is as one side, you are required to be internationally acknowledged, uh, 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 publishing in an international uh, uh, kind of arena, but at the same time, you are living into, in conditions that are very much uh, uh, undermined uh, by 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 the the current situation. You know, you wake up with very uh, electricity cuts, uh, water uh, crisis, trash crisis. This is something part of your everyday life. You wake up in the morning, you feel it, you come to work, and then you have to assume that you have to be uh, an excellent researcher and, and doing all of that kind of, kind of work. So, and at the same time, the, the, as, as my colleagues also kind of were m uh, mentioning, the themes that we, we, we investigate are sometimes themes uh, uh, also uh, uh, disconnected with this kind of reality. Um, we always uh, assume that we could uh, we are doing research in a normal situation, but there is nothing normal about about what we are going through. So how do you really uh, go through all this bureaucratic uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, requirements, uh, having a, a, 
get, getting fundings from 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 uh, from uh, big institutions, getting IRB approvals, uh, conducting the work, uh, uh, knowing that actually there is so much uncertainty in the everyday uh, uh, work in this uh, in, in doing research. That's a kind of I think very interesting. Um, uh, paradox that many of the researchers uh, face. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, and in all of this, I'm not really trying to. I'm just trying to really kind of give a little bit diagnostic uh, trend or trends. Uh, what is going on? The other, the other aspect of this, uh, and and you know, my colleague Fouad knows this uh, very well. Uh, there is the. What what is the research at, in, in under under war? The way we conduct research be, uh, becomes transformed by uh, whoever is shaping the agenda of research. So so in in a place like uh, Lebanon, where we are facing so many uh, uh, different problems, there is no state, there is no kind of central national funding for research in the country. We have become more and more dependent on. Uh, funding that comes in from uh, uh, research, uh, from in funding institutions that are uh, has a certain kind of agenda. So that that has definitely shaped what we research in general. Um, uh, and and there is a very interesting trend with that research is that we are more and more required, at least within the health sciences, to do more policy research, policy oriented research. And uh, there is nothing, of course, there's nothing wrong with that. But but the interest is the interesting question is is that we are dealing with uh, policymakers who are probably part of the problem. They are the ones who have created some of the, many of these problems. We are dealing with state institutions that are uh, we know they're corrupt. Uh, we know international organizations and humanitarian organizations are corrupt. We know all of these organizations have actually contributed to this uh, crisis, but yet we still have faith in that actually if I write a policy recommendation, a technical one based on evidence, that something will change or something will improve. But, you know, one way to see this is, is there's a kind of a little bit of a malaise at this level. You know, I mean, I really wake up every morning and try to think, okay, what kind of policy recommendations I could have to, to, to the UNHCR, but I know actually the UNHCR is one of the, the main problems of how the refugee crisis has been unfolding in this, in, in, in this country or in other places. So, so there is a very fine line. Uh, uh, between between uh, what do we really define as policy and how we are actually ourselves are implicated in that. The other the other trend in in this is uh, is uh, is I think we need to also know that our value system that we use in terms of research is very much tied to our middle class, upper middle class value systems. Our way of understanding subjects, our subjects of research is very much in, uh, 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 tied with how we think about, about the world and how we uh, approach it. So uh, uh, it is, it's fascinating that we, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, maybe we go and, and work in the camp or work in different kind of places where there's a lot of suffering, and we kind of talk about the suffering as we are witnessing this this uh, this uh, this experience of the other uh, in these places. However, we never really and and we suggest that you know no one should be uh, going through this, and of course we all all of us believe in that. However, what is what is the value of keeping producing that kind of narrative about a suffering subject, about a victim? Uh, of war, and I think uh, uh, I think many. Uh, this is a, a very much of an important tension that we need to think about, especially if we are in this business of war for a long for a long time. Uh, uh, I, I think here, and I, this is kind of my last point, I, uh, to, and stop here. And I think we really need to rethink war as a as a as a just an event that dis just destroys things. Uh, but actually, war is a, a, a as a process that uh, gives life to new forms of realities, new form, modes of sociality, new uh, economic relations. And rather than kind of uh, uh, thinking about, you know, what just has been destroyed, we need to also think as much as what is being really being renegotiated, rebuilt uh, uh, in these kind of settings. And in 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 doing that, I guess I guess we need to be thinking of ourselves as researchers. I mean, I, I'm, sometimes I 
feel so um, uh, 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 uncomfortable with what even I do as a researcher. And, and then I kind of remind myself is that what I'm doing is more just archiving for something that will come later on. I mean, to, uh, when people ask me, what do you think the, the solution for this, uh, cr the Syrian crisis or the Iraq, you know, I mean, you're, you, 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 I mean you, you just kind of stop there and you think you shouldn't be kidding yourself. You don't know. You don't know and you don't know where it's going and this is much bigger than you. And, uh, but, you know, I think one way I convince myself that all of this could be as, as, as to accept my to do, doing research as a vocation is that I am someone in the business of documenting something that maybe will be helpful for others, maybe will be helpful for producing more knowledge, maybe thinking about uh, 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 the future in a different kind of way. But at the end of the day, I don't, we don't, I, th I don't think research in general has solutions to, to, to these conditions. But actually, it is part of the condition and it is definitely shaped by it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for raising some very critical questions, and Omar, you ended with a, a powerful image of war as a process and not an event. If we look at it as a process and not an event, how would it change the academic research that, that we do? Without me taking advantage of my role as moderator with asking the questions that I'm hungry to ask, I'm actually going to open the floor to you all with any questions or comments that you have, either as your experience as graduate students, as researchers, as academics, as practitioners, there's a, a range of you in the audience, so we would love to hear from you, particularly on the difficult question that you all raise, which is how do we produce impactful, meaningful research for the communities that we most care about? If I could trouble you to just identify yourself uh, with the microphone. That'd be great. Oh, my. my name is Sucha, I'm a graduate student in sociology. Thank you very much for very interesting uh, interventions and comments. I have a question that oh, kind of built on everything you e each, each and every one of you said uh, on the you know, kind of, uh, one of you. If you had to choose um, one area of priority for research in the Arab world based on your experience and you know the challenges you've highlighted, so whether it's the lack of framework, the different hats we wear, the politics of the academic jargon, or even you know, the material conditions of the researcher, and sometimes the problem of over-research and over-research communities, so what would these priorities be? Bearing in mind that a lot of us look at you know, the, our work as um, researchers or future researchers as being something that is very committed, and bearing in mind this idea that we want to do something could we take a few questions from the floor before coming back to you all, if that's okay? Um, I'm Samir Jabour from the Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, I think uh, building on Omar's intervention, um, uh, I have uh, really thought that a good part of our discussion perhaps uh, will lead to center about how we as an institution here at AEB have been, uh, have been engaging uh, with the crisis uh, of Gaza and in which we are part, uh, but how we have not been able to engage with these processes or so. And I think, um, you know, uh, uh, this perhaps is, uh, is uh, one form where uh, where this discussion can, uh, can start unfolding. Although there have been several public forums of discussing uh, uh, the, uh, the crisis, the uprisings, and the revolutions, but institutional response has not been um, uh, uh, put under scrutiny to understand where we have, uh, uh, where we have, uh, as an institution, personally as research or so, um, uh, have managed um, uh, to create a new discourse. And I think uh, you are presenting a new discourse, this is important, but also where um, the institution uh, uh, offers an opportunity, not to be just critical, but where it offers an opportunity for the transformational process you spoke about. So I hope that we make this discussion. 
Thank you so much for uh, this insightful talk. Um, three points, very quickly. Uh, uh, the first, uh, well, uh, I like what you said, Omar, about uh, uh, we should stretch our understanding what is a war. For instance, uh, what is going on in, 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 in Egypt nowadays, uh, for instance, where uh, uh, Anthropologists are killed because they are doing a sensitive research. It's, about, it's also uh, a kind of, uh, uh, I mean, working in authoritarian uh, setting where it is the protracted situation in the Arab world uh, uh, and in the settler colonial context in Palestine is is really there. So, uh, so I would say we we, live, we have lived in conflict in the last half century. I would say. Um, and uh, so, but but then for for me the the question uh, always the problem of uh, scholarly community when they go public, where here they enter into tension between their critical thinking and their uh, 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 need to serve the community. And, uh, here, where we will have a complex in entanglements. I mean, because if. Uh, if you will publish in uh, in a three journals in English, etc., your Libyan friends will not read it, and uh, you can you can do what uh, you can say whatever you want. But because you speak up, etc., so this is this is uh, this is an issue. Um, so uh, um, uh, so the, so if I take the case of Egypt, what is the difference between um, um, death penalty? of uh, Professor Shaheen from EUC, uh, allegedly belonging to Muslim Brotherhood, and the case of Regimi, the Italian anthropologist. Why that the Italian uh, anthropologist, I mean, become so global and international, this issue, and is still going on, and maybe, and why is there is a total silence about Professor Shaheen? I think because of the lack of scientific community, the, 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 the institutionalization of, of our scientific community to protect uh, the individual researcher. So, I, so somehow I want to, uh, this, uh, to say it's not only Omar, the question of individual and the institution, there is really whether we have a scientific community and how we will consolidate, uh, con con consolidate our position. Uh, in, in case of uh, what happened in Egypt or what happened in Lebanon, like Fuad doesn't have a work permit so far. So I don't have a work permit either. Yeah, yeah so, and, so I, I, think, I think this is a, a serious <laughs> so Just in Omar, in 1951, uh, the emergence of Convention uh, of Refugee was so uh, progressive because read Hannah Arendt what happened in the second day of the Second World War, the massive denaturalization. So, so, so creating a refugee status is something extremely important. Now, how the international organization depoliticizes this is another story. We'll just take the fourth question and bring it back to the, to the uh, <coughs> I'd like to pick up on something that uh, Carmen mentioned, uh, the issue of theory. Uh, there's a difference between studying conflict so the research on conflict is study within the conflict situation. And I would like to ask, uh, is the difference merely quantitative, or is there really a qualitative difference uh, when you're doing research in a conflict situation? Do things really change dramatically, significantly, in the, in the scientific sense of significant? Or is it just more of the same? Because doing research on sensitive topics exists in peaceful situations, it exists in the West, it's not really anything new, but in our, in our reality, is there really a qualitative difference when you're doing research within a conflict situation? Uh, issues like reactivity, the way that the thing you're studying, the people, the, uh, the communities, whatever, is that different in the conflict situation? Or effectiveness, in, I'm from Austria originally, we use the word Petroffenheit, how we're affected by what we're studying. We change too, not that's just the thing. Is that different in a conflict situation? Uh, are you aware of any theories on this topic? Uh, is, is there is there is there a body? I'm unaware of it, but is there a, 
even a, a nation body of theoretical work on research in conflict situations. Uh, uh, I like to compare what we're doing in conflict situations to something I prefer to uh, call it the Jurassic Park syndrome. If you remember Jurassic Park 1, the scientists are studying the dinosaurs and they're so excited until the dinosaurs devour scientists. Uh, and I think that we're in danger of being devoured, either figuratively or, or actually sometimes <laughs> uh, in, in reality. Uh, be, because we, we put ourselves in dangerous situations, but we're sort of sucked into this in this Jurassic Park uh, syndrome. Uh, uh, we did research on, on the evacuation in 2006 during the evacuation. Uh, uh, well, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Eugene Sensini Pabuz. I'm from the Faculty of Law and Political Science at NDU. Uh, so we did research during the evacuation, on the evacuation, and we decided not to evacuate. <laughs> so you made a decision, I'm staying, I could go, right? Uh, and now you're studying those who decide to go. That's a highly uh, loaded, biased situation you're in, which is the, the bad question again is the theory. And finally, at the moment we're doing research on the insertion or the integration of Lebanese children in the afternoon schools, the second shift schools, in Lebanese public schools. Uh, again, uh, I'm working with the project in Akkar. I think our project is great. But we're, we're surveying all of them, right? So uh, in these conflict situations, is there really a qualitative difference, or it's just more of the same sensitive research is a little bit more sensitive than otherwise? Thank you. Who would like to begin? I can do it. It's okay. Um, first question. Uh, priority. I think, I think I'll, I'll turn the question on you. I mean, why do you want to have a priority for research? I mean, what, what, what would the priority uh, uh, discourse, let's say, uh, allow us to, I mean, I mean again, it is, it is a question that goes back to policy setting, research funding, and all of that. Yes, I agree with you that we need certain kind of priorities. But again, also to question that notion of why do we need to prioritize what is should be research, I think we need to start from what is really, uh, in, uh, at least it's a very disciplinary also question. I mean, each dif different disciplines have their own kind of interests and priorities. But at least for me, in a, as an anthropologist, uh, one of the main things is that I, 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 to go back to this kind of schizophrenic conflict, you know, I read, I read the body of literature in anthropology and I cannot recognize anything from the everyday things that I see in my, uh, in my experience as a human being, as someone who at least know what this means in terms of knowledge production. Uh, so, so for example, I'll give you an example, this whole interest in defining this war as a religious war, you know. Everyone has come jump on that wagon because it's like the sexy thing. Anyone who studies sectarianism goes on TV and speaks with CNN and again, it becomes part of that whole researcher's career, building your own kind of uh, reputation, you're more visible, you're doing this and that. But you know, and I know, I know it is so in your face, the whole religious kind of aspect. But actually, if you're an anthropologist and if you're a sociologist, you know that the underpinning problems here are much more complicated than just a religious narrative or ideology. You realize these conflicts are embedded in geopolitics, they're embedded in socioeconomic relations, region, regionality, the issue of, let's say, the Syrian, Syrian crisis. People, now it's so easy to define, this guy is Alawi, this guy is Sunni, oh, this guy is with this or this. But actually, Syria is, even for Syrians, they always deal with each other in terms of regions. This guy is from Raqqa, this guy is from Halab, this guy is from Ruqqa. Uh, the regionality aspect has lost its uh, importance, for example, in defining how we identify kind of the problems of war. So, so I think for me, so one of the priorities in, for me is to debunk all the discourses or the intellectual production and knowledge production that I find to be completely uh, problematic in the way it describes the region. So it's not just about representation, 
but it's also about how we can uh, uh, can create a better narrative to actually make a, a, a look at people here not just as these cultural beings as produced by religious ideologies or culture or but actually just as rational subjects who are dealing with everyday today problems you know I mean things that as a collective we have other things we can actually talk about. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's one thing. So for me, I, I I find there is a little bit of a disjunct with what kind of research questions. The way we put the research questions, I think, needs to be prioritized as relevant things that are actually are based on um, phenomena that you that you that you feel are important to to the. If you are studying the crisis, then what is really what is a, a phenomena that you can actually use to think about that? So. Uh, so, I don't know if that answers the question, but, but again, I think the, to go back, to, to sum it up, to say that the idea of a priority also needs to be re thought, because, you know, is this because economics? Do we, is it because funding for research is limited and we need to prioritize, or uh, to prioritize in terms of relevance, let's say. Um, so that's, I think, uh, the question. Samer, uh, to Samer, uh, we have not been able to engage, and I, I, I agree, and I think partly, again, goes back to reflecting, maybe it's also Sari's question, reflecting on the position of the institution in relationship to the political, to the, to the politics of these conflicts. You know, we cannot separate a place like AUB from the politics of Lebanon. You know, AUB is actually even defined. A lot of it is through the politics of Lebanon. Uh, you know, how people are uh, in, a, in a very segmentary way, these guys are part of this camp, these guys are part of that camp. So that, that you know, tells you that we're not really kind of these neutral uh, uh, individuals who are just trying to, uh, uh, you know, tell the truth to everyone. We are part of the game, we're implicated. And, and I think the, the uprisings were interesting, partly because they were a rebellion against uh, the malaise and the lull that happened with institutions and, and of course experience a, a place like Egypt where most of universities are state institutions. So a, a kind of a rebellion against the state by default is a rebellion against the way science and scientific institutions have been car carrying itself uh, through, throughout, uh, throughout time. So I think, I think we are implicated in uh, in maintaining the status quo in many ways because we as individuals as a scientific community we are we have we have also uh, benefits in 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 things to continue as they as they are because any question to the status quo is a question to our own salaries careers lives uh, you know so I think there is a big is a big uh, uh, paradox here is that if you if you want your career to continue you shouldn't be really be too radical because that means that you are questioning your own your own kind of implication but these are not accusations but they're I think they're just observations to to see that we are part of a certain kind of class that benefits from the continuation of things as the way they are and also invested in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain kind of way of change, you know? So I think that is a very important point, at least to interrogate these positionalities of, 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 of the academic community. And yes, Asari, I think you're totally right. In Egypt, it's completely uh, amazing that, you know, an Italian anthropologist gets all this kind of uh, media attention while you know, and a local, a local uh, academic doesn't, um, and and I think yes, there is a lack of that community. Uh, that, uh, but also, you know, we also know that for the West, our lives are not worth as much as their lives. You know, if we something happens to us, it's not really like a big deal. We're a collateral, but in, for a Westerner to lose their life, it's a big deal. I mean, I think the question would be also to you is why don't we really. Uh, also get pissed off and angry about any life that is, is, is killed or like why is it just the academic life is more important than let's say uh, someone dying in, in, in Raqqa or someone dying anywhere else. I think these are kind of very important questions for us is when is because we mobilize around certain kind of uh, events. 
you know, what events really touches us uh, is, is something very important. But, you know, there are many people are dying at the same time in Egypt. Not just they're, because they're academics, they mean they, they have uh, um, more value. Um, research on conflict, and I think, I think that, that tension of research in conflict and on conflict is, uh, is very central here. Um, and I think it's very embodied also, as I said, you know, it's just something you wake up with every day. Um, and, and I guess for an anthropologist, uh, I, you know, we study the anthropology of the body and everyday life. So that aspect for me, at least, has been my inspiration to, to uh, 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 kind of put, put down the more important questions. I was asked once by, by uh, a student, uh, you know, I was talking about like, some, res uh, some of the observations we've been making. And they said, you know, so how did you, is this scientific, not scientific, because it's, it's about everyday observation. I said, listen, you know, you, wa uh, you, you, uh, you wake up every day, you open the door, you walk to a UB, and, and everything is happening around you. I mean, that is basically, for me, at least the starting point. Because if I'm writing about the social or about society, then that's my starting point. And part of it is something you are experiencing, and this is at least to be biased towards the anthropological field, the ethnographic kind of method, is I think, the, uh, I think that was kind of the original idea, is that you need to live it. You need to actually be affected physically and socially and psychologically by living in a place so you can be you so you're able to write about it it's not just kind of a remote uh, observation about a place but actually you really need to get sick to 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 deal with the electricity cuts so to be able to at least understand how 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 that experience is unfolding so and 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 and, and what is really interesting uh, when i i review a lot of articles and um, you know from public health to anthropology, and I s f sometimes feel this is completely disconnected with what does it mean to live in that place that like, I probably know better, better because I'm living in it. So I think we just need to be a little bit more honest with what we are talking about and, and how we're talking about it. And, and, maybe, and maybe kind of re-question the tools that we've been handed in. And because if war is undoing so many things, it might be also undoing the models that we've been using to understand it, to understand the real, uh, everyday reality. So how can we really begin to look at these uh, uh, tools also in a different kind of way? Thank you, Amal. Yeah, sorry, I took, I took a little bit. Uh, do we have to get sick while doing research? <laughs> We are sick to do research. I, I try to answer uh, several questions in, a, you know, in one answer, maybe. maybe. Uh, I mean, uh, I think that we don't know how to do research in conflict, in uncertainty, in sort of, you know, huge change. I mean, um, we, we, as Omar said, we need to be honest. We still don't know why. Maybe we don't have the right tools. Maybe we don't have the good methodology, if I want to use the, the terms. Maybe we don't know. Um, we didn't develop, you know, yet, you know, the issue of uh, uh, how to approach in such a sort of uh, protracted context. I mean, that's, we're still in the beginning. But also, I, I want to add from my experience in health sciences that we still approach the issue of conflict, I mean health in conflict, using the tools of health. That's what we know, you know. We don't know how to have a social tools or political tools and how to mix them together. I mean, how to look in conflict from different, you know, disciplines at the same time and then we can come to conclusion or some others. So we still, we don't know. Yani maybe our priority is to know. You know. Just at least we have, I mean, I don't know if it's to say it good or bad, but we have an opportunity. We are live in this context and we will keep doing you know, that. I mean, that's, that's things that will not change Bukra or maybe next week or maybe next decade or I mean, I don't know. That there's a, a huge opportunity to 
contribute, you know, in world. I mean, in the issue of how to develop, let's say, you know, science to be inside this, uh, you know, uh, global discussion about because we are here and we, I think, are in close, uh, you know, contact with the, all these issues. You know, back to, or, or to, just to link with the Samuel's questions you know, for the institutions here. I mean, it's also a surprise, I mean, to see after five years of uh, Syria crisis, this is the new one, and Yemen crisis also, it's, you know, now three years, or maybe, I mean, talking about war, and Libya, and look on the, uh, into the uh, productions of research. Just, you know, do that, uh, literature review that we all use that and see the what the outcome it's really you know surprising you know very very few so what we are doing all of us you know so you know in this big institution well recognized institution one of the top in the Middle East but what's the outcome you know I, I mean that's it's, this is really a question I don't have an answer I, mean, I think that we need to discuss why there's no you know an, at least you know Good response to that. I mean, we don't know how to respond. Maybe you know, the, you know, I can answer quickly about the process itself. It to to propose and then to get fund and to go with all these bureaucratic issues. Things change. In many papers that were uh, were published, quickly you can you you can see that the uh, the um, you know this abstract and then the results and it's completely disconnected with the, you know, what, what you know about the current situation. Talking about, you know, the example that I, I wrote about death. So you see number of death and uh, it's completely, now it's different issues. So you're talking about, you know, what happened. I mean, because things change, you know, if, if I want to write something about health system now in the region, you know, in Lebanon, you know, that's, we have, you know, 25% you know, it's roughly number of Syrian refugees, you know, uh, uh, um, 25 population are Syrian refugees. But if we want to write something about health system in Lebanon, we go to write about the national health system in Lebanon. And we cannot see the impact or all that interaction with the new issues. It's not about just refugees, it's about, you know, many organization that jumped in now uh, the uh, Lebanon and they engage in all that discussion I mean they 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 give money or they change the process or that but we, we don't know how to measure it's not just quantity I mean, how, how to measure the impact in, 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 in by all means I think that the issue of understanding is still uh, um, it's a major issue and for this I guess that uh, we need to um, I put some examples about, you know, research that engage about sexual violence just to reflect on that, you know, they, you know, the, the donors came with this issue of they want to do something about sexual violence and they, they know what, how to do it and the issue of all that, you know, crises in the future, in the, in the, in the past and then, and, but, you know, there's nothing about the dynamic of that. What all this uh, 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 sensitive issues inside. It's very, it's purely um, uh, a technical issue. And then, then some conclusion. I mean, there's, uh, you know, many uh, articles on this. Anyway, but uh, 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 sorry for this convention of 51. Also, this is another issue of politics, you know, in when talking about, it may be, I'm not sure, I can argue, it may be uh, was a progressive, it might be progressive at that time. But, um, but, you know, when, when looking for the, all these consequences that happen, you know, you know um, that time, ONERWA was established, right? Since then, ONERWA is a sort of uh, an emergency, let's say, entity to respond to Palestinian needs. How many, and you wrote a, a book on that, how many problems they solve to engage Palestinians, you know, in the, uh, in the, um, um, the region, you know. So, so what's, the, what's the impact and let's say what's the benefits? Uh, what are the benefits of this, you know, having a new system to solve problem and then created many other problems? Do you think that, you know, and, but now we have it uh, for granted. We're talking about refugees. I cannot say that uh, it's a sort of just very artificial issues created by, by people 
in a in a way or another, and then we are stuck in that, and we cannot challenge this, and we cannot say that okay, I don't I don't care about refugees, uh, you know, and I need to talking about these human beings, you know, in a context. So I think that you know my my feeling that we need to have politics. I mean, in the region, in every discussion, in every word we are talking about. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Choosing a priority. <laughs> I think that the priority is for us to write. I think that we need uh, more people from this part of the world to decide to write, right? I mean, I think the priority is not what to say, but publishing. And I, uh, I know that um, I agree that it's difficult to publish in global journals where you know people here don't read. But I think the contrary. I think that we should invade uh, those journals and we should invade those standards with locally produced knowledge by people that live here. One of my motivations, I mean, I worked like, I did policy recommendations from here until the moon for 10 years and I felt there wasn't a lot of impact and in, in the process of doing that, one of the things that used to upset me is probably the work that we've done and that I've done has been featured in several, several master theses and PhD theses and articles by people that were Middle East experts that had come here for two weeks, maybe two months, uh, and that proceeded to write in global outlets about this part of the world. And I decided that I want to write about this part of the world. And I think that, I mean, you're a graduate student, right? You're a graduate student. And I think that you should choose something that you're passionate about and persist in trying to write that and publish that. And I think that that's part of the role that we can do um, to remain engaged in academia. So I wouldn't, you know, I'm skeptical, yes, about the standards and the scope, but I think that we should. I think we have an obligation to keep on writing. Um, and about research in a conflict, I don't know. I will tell you what I think could be different. I, uh, I was trained in St. Andrews with a professor, Jeffrey Muir, on research ethics, and he does work in Europe on uh, dangerous communities, uh, skinheads and Nazis and drug addicts and things like this. And he used to say that even when the research subject is so problematic or potentially dangerous that you will always have that insider, outsider, I mean, and people that have done research on prisoners as well, I mean, you will develop a connection. But I think in, during a conflict, and part of the discussion that the, you know, we were having is like, what's a conflict, right? I mean, is it only condition of war? Is it structural conflict? Is it um, you know, gender conflict? There are different forms of conflict. And I think that we should first look at people as agents. I like what you said. People are rational. They're not categories of people. People have agency. People can decide um, to partake in a conflict or stop it. They can decide on their own path of political transition. I work on like democratization and whatnot. And I mean, people can decide. It's not that some you know, expert, it's not Ban Ki-moon who's going to decide. People have agency. And I think that we, can, we need to listen during a conflict. Um, more than bring with it, and that, of course, has implications on what theory you use. Uh, second, I think we need to be very careful during a conflict who we include in the research, okay, because the people that we will exclude from a research will not go down in history, and in the hope that we are producing knowledge that can cumulatively improve, you know, the world, we need to be careful that the people that we're not including uh, will not go down in that, you know, uh, archive, and I think that we need to be very careful on who to include. And the third thing, I think, uh, yes, I mean, we need to create maybe, I think we have a d double, we have to do two efforts in the Arab world, in this part of the world. We have to ha make an effort to invade international journals, but I think that we also have um, an opportunity um, uh, and an obligation to try to publish locally or to speak locally. I mean, what's wrong with chatting to activists? Well, why can't researchers, you know, have a conversation, have a cup of coffee, say, look, this is what we suggest. We're health experts, this is what we suggest you know you should do, not to the Lebanese government, but to people. So I think we need to publish it in uh, two places. I don't know what those are my thoughts. Let me just ask if there's any other uh, questions or comments from the floor. I'm Eden Wahid, yeah. Thank you again, Fatih. <coughs> Thank you all. This has been fascinating. Uh, I'm Iman Wayne, and I'm the Faculty of Health Sciences. I happen to be the Dean of the Faculty for some time. And um, I, I agree with the points that have been, have been actually been raised by the speakers. My, my problem throughout, and still is, that when we, we tend to romanticize who we are and uh, what we stand for, 
And uh, so, so when we think about ourselves as public health professionals, or when we think about ourselves as, as researchers, for, for one reason or the other, we, we, we tend to, to see ourselves as a category that is different than the rest of the population. A, a category that's above all, a category that's able to detach itself and look at things objectively. And, and I think that's a problematic in, in some of your uh, uh, presentations. It's uh, forget about war and, and talk about peacetime and evaluate uh, research in this university in the region or even in the US and other places. And you find again that the, the problem has been also that the academic researchers, researchers in general, in academic institutions or research institutions, they actually fall on a spectrum. And you have most of the research is technical research that's totally disconnected, depoliticized, and and uh, and uninformed by the by the social and political context of, uh, of of the situation. So this is the reality of most of the research. Now take take that context and put it in a context of war. It becomes more painful and more striking of saying, let's uh, we talk about war in this region. It's true that we're privileged as a region that we have the longest wars and the <laughs> highest number of displays and all of this. But wars have been taking place in Africa, has been taking place in Latin America, has been taking place in Europe. And, and the deficiencies that we're talking about here have been dragging for a hundred years. So on one hand, Tamar, I would feel a little bit less uh, 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 despaired and I would say that the kind of discussion that we're actually holding and engaging in today here in this room is quite advanced. I said it in the, and I was criticized for being too pompous for, for, for the faculty, but I said what we're discussing in our faculty and what we're discussing at AUB is far advanced than what's being discussed anywhere in the, in the world. It's still deficient, it's still and not, uh, uh, not responding to, 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 to what we, or at least achieving what we want to do, but nonetheless, it's quite advanced. Um, the, the issue of we, uh, for us, we're talking about the fact that researchers uh, do this alone, and I don't know what stops you or any researcher at the UB or at the Anna at the University of talking to the sociologists or the political scientists or to the economists. Who's holding you back? I agree that there are institutional restrictions, but who's holding any researcher from actually bringing in the sociologists on board and the anthropologists on board and the sociologists on board? This is not written anywhere, it's not structured anywhere, and we all know that, uh, that multidisciplinary research is actually much more attractive to funding agencies, and, and our faculty has succeeded actually in presenting that. So uh, there's, there's something about, about uh, the, the, the other, or somebody has to do something about uh, about us or other research. I think I think the reality is that we have researchers on again on wide spectrum, and those who think differently are going to to, to impose and change that. Difference. And this is true for AUB or any other university. It's researchers like yourself that are going to push the envelope and and, and change it. Finally, just to make an analogy and a reflection on the research that take, uh, took place on AIDS and HIV. For many years, that research was defined by scientists and researchers who did things very technically and counting who has AIDS, until the civil society started changing the agenda of, of what, what is really important for, uh, for AIDS uh, and HIV patients, the issue of, uh, of uh, uh, inequity, what's happening in Africa, and all of this, and that has forced funding agencies and researchers to think differently. We're, we're, we're not living in a void where we have to go out and change the world. We're, as, as, as we said, Colin, we have to keep documenting and expressing what we want and push that and uh, The institution will not, there's no institution that wakes up the next day and says, oh, I haven't been doing this. It's people like yourself who's so going to remind the institution that they're doing something or they're not doing it. I think there was a question right there. Yeah. Do you guys want to respond? Stephanie Schneer, undergraduate uh, 
international affairs and diplomacy in the EU. I have a question for Carmen. Following up to what Dr. Omar stated, that the surroundings as well as the context in which the researcher is conducting his or her case study, uh, uh, it highly affects uh, the researcher's uh, objectivity. So what were some of the challenges that you faced knowing that the Libyan environment might have affected the objectivity of the individuals that you interviewed, such as the uh, military leaders and tribal leaders, as well as your own, and how did that affect the, uh, the research approach that you were taking? Thank you. Um, again, just any last questions or comments? Okay, we'll take one more. Give it back to the panel. Sorry, I'm a new international affairs student at NU. Uh, I have a question. It's about that, despite that uh, research is very essential to the community and society, its results are sometimes not translated to a language that the community can really understand. So I mean, a research uh, is for the research topic, the society, for benefiting it. It's more than for the researcher himself. So dealing with the terminology is mentioned, and um, even in the cases of when it's policy-oriented, uh, where do the benefit of these research and researches rely? Thank you. So who here wants to uh, uh, respond? Uh, <laughs> I can try. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure that there is that you can be objective, right, in any con context of research. And I'm sure that you're working uh, in your classes on on that concept. So how does the lack of objectivity then affect the lens in which you view? Uh, what's happening. Uh, so I was very much affected by the surrounding. Okay, first, you, I couldn't find a theory to wrap around what I knew intuitively was happening. And so my research was on the challenges of activism and the fact that you know the Libyan transition was very much constrained. And so first, I couldn't find the, that one theory, right? I mean, so you have to think a little bit how to ground uh, different concepts and then come up with theory. Uh, second, object, I mean, the conditions of people being able to come out and speak about those experiences was also very new for the people that were being studied. And that's why we're thinking of not only in conflict, but in post-authoritarian uh, settings. And I think that it affects you more than you can affect uh, the flow of that information and what's coming to you. Uh, I'll tell you, like, one key challenge was, was uh, grasping the culture, right? I mean, um, uh, the context of citizenship and participation, even if religion in this part of the world, is very different than in North Africa. And so, I mean, one of the key challenges was making some really bad, uh, politically incorrect mistakes in places like Masrata, uh, and then um, having to come back and then study it better and then acquire that language, but without seeming, you know, too presumptuous. Um, so I think, I think the the search is more of a listening search, and then trying to find. I know that maybe some. Uh, professors won't like this, but I think it's about writing what you know intuitively to be true and matching it with an outlet and not the other way around. That's what I would say. Uh, Ahmed and Fuad, would you like to say something? Uh, I, I want just to comment a bit on the uh, Dean's comments. That, uh, um, yes, I mean, so um, I think, you're, of course, you're right. I mean, that's no one prevent us, you know, from doing this, you know. And yes, because it's a deed. It's I the deed. Of course it's <laughs> no, but the issue of, uh, maybe I should put it like in a positive uh, way. I mean, that we should uh, engage more. I mean, if any, I mean, that's very few examples about having collaborative, strong collaborative work. But that should be sort of priority now is such a sort of complexity you know, complex con context. We need to push that direction. Yes, maybe the, uh, the funders are interested in this sort of issue, but the way that we work still limited, either because of overwhelming or priorities in each uh, uh, department or, or, or even uh, individual, but this is, you know, uh, that context, this issue is a very important uh, let's say, a point to do more collaborative, more work on, you know, understanding tools. I mean, it's not just working together. It's about also understanding the, you know, um, uh, the tools itself or the, the, the way we think about it. So, you know, that I'm trying to say, you know, how to approach 
uh, health in context of war or any conflict without knowing you know, the, how to do that uh, in, in political issues or, or to understand this part of issue. Demographic issues, or, you know, the issue of uh, uh, um, uh, 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 society. So all that issues, maybe we need to put that a sort of priority in curriculum in you know the the the, the agenda of uh, of uh, the the each faculty to put like a sort of priority to have you know in in in, in evaluation of each one i mean that should be a sort of part of our thinking so i hope that's in this positive way you will be happy with that uh, sarah i think that the issue of how to translate re result i mean that's also this is an important issue and also we need to to know how to advocate. Yani we are also, as a re researcher, we don't know how to advocate. And we, know, we, you know, we have now a you know, sort of center to do K2P or uh, knowledge to, in, into, into practice or into um, more, let's say, uh, translation. But that's also it's a beginning. Uh, th this is important to see how that can be um, done in strongly in the future. Okay, so so I wrote three notes here, so I can, that I can answer to objective and subjective. I think, I think we, I mean, this is a common uh, at least uh, thing that I hear that the idea of an objectivity and subjectivity, almost like the subjective is a, such a bad is a bad thing, and the objective is the is the right way to do it as a scientist. And if you actually really go back to this idea, where it comes from, and how it emerged. That objectivity really was tied so much to a certain kind of uh, scientific work that that it's reproducibility, that you're dealing with things that you can actually experiment with, and it kind of so in a way that notion of objectivity was so much tied to this idea of reproducibility. When the sociologist came in and said, "Listen, there is another, um, uh, there uh, 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 there is another way of 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 thinking about the world." another metaphysics almost. And that has to do with meaning. That actually human interaction, human institution, human action in general is, is, is subjective in relationship to meaning. And that doesn't mean it is not scientific. It means that we need different kind of tools, different kind of ways of interpreting it. But it doesn't mean that subjectivity is the kind of negative thing and objectivity is the, is the more scientific one. It means that these are two approaches to understanding the reality uh, that we live in. So, so it's really interesting. I hear it a lot. And of course, I was, you know, when, when we were like, you know, in science, uh, science uh, is a, we always thought that, oh, oh, this is subjective. That means it's actually dismissed. It's actually something that you, it's biased. But that's not really the case. The word subjective comes from a whole body of literature that explores meaning as the the scientific study of meaning that subjectivity so so it doesn't mean that when we say subjective it, it means that we're dealing with different kind of questions and then answering them is different is it is somewhat different and i mean i cannot agree more than with you than than the, the romantic position this is exactly what i was trying to say is that we think our values uh, are like this kind of separate we're kind of we know the truth but you know we're still also part of a class that is interested in a certain kind of advancement of our lives and our kids and our institutions and whatever you know so I think I think we need to always interrogate where we're coming from and I think that that kind of uh, aspect you you pointed out to very nicely you know I've been thinking recently about the interdisciplinary uh, kind of thing because we also talk about it without really and because without thinking about it in a little bit uh, more uh, critical way. We celebrate in interdisciplinarity. But also we know, because it's better funded, but to what extent it actually could answer questions is really interesting. Can we think actually about anti-disciplinarity? You know, a, a, pl a place where we actually go back to a certain way of thinking about knowledge in a much more of a problem-based rather than a disciplinary based approach. So I think I think to answer to go back to your question about the priorities, I think we need to go back to a problem based approach rather than a disciplinary one. And I think this is definitely brings in the different people in the discipline, but also opens up the 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 
potentiality of thinking. You know, just you know, why do we? I mean, the old the old uh, Hakim in, in in our history was someone who you know knew astro uh, astro uh, astrophysics and knew uh, medicine and knew all of that. There is that was and an a poet and, and a poet and you know a linguist and all of that. That was an antidisciplinary figure. That that's a person who is moved by questions. Um, uh, you know what later on became called Renaissance figure, uh, uh, what is uh, uh, Renaissance uh, figure or whatever. So I think maybe this is the time where disciplines, uh, because the more and more we go into specialization, the more trivial our knowledge becomes. You know, the more I become specialized in a pl in a in a in a topic, the more uh, this idea of 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 knowledge production becomes really. So, what happens if you step back and say, "Listen, can I learn something new?" And actually, tr is this tool um, uh, helpful for me to answer this question or not? So, anyway, is is there a place for interdisciplinarity, and for universities that become interdisciplinary? Is really, in, as I think, is an interesting question for. For the future, one department, you know, <laughs> one department for all <laughs> humans, you know. You know, there are universities that are, that are emerging that uh, you don't get a bachelor's of science in biology; you get a bachelor's of science, yeah, period, or you get a bachelor's of arts, and that's it. And so they're working to dismantle this idea that you can graduate with a political science degree and minor in economics. They argue you cannot do such a thing. To actually be a political scientist, you have to have a grounding in all the humanities. So it's an exciting new um, university that's popping up in the United Kingdom. Um, what I find personally to be so excited by this is that we asked questions, and it's rare to have an event where people aren't rushing to find answers, but rather are spending significant time simply finding the questions that need to be asked. And so this is a journey, uh, both for academics and particularly for the Asfari Institute, and we hope that we will have many other events where we'll be breaking down the issues into the kind of questions, like Omar says, to be moved by the questions, to be asking such critical discussions. We're also very much open, and, and we say this every time we have an event, if any of you have a particular question about the relationship between academia and civil society, the relationship between the production of knowledge and the empowerment of social justice that you do want to have explored, please do let us know at the Institute. Our doors are very much open. And please do continue this discussion with us next week at our conference, where we're going to be spending three days discussing and analyzing the many academic challenges we have and the obstacles that faculty and students have, as well as the opportunities that they have to more actively engage in social justice. So with that, thank you very much for your time and thank the three of you for your time. Thank you so much.